Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Today is June 19th, 2020. We have a special service today featuring preacher Joy Moore. We better get to it because she's got a big word for us today. The title of her sermon is When a Man Needs Justice, but it's also helping us think about this day, known as Juneteenth. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing enslaved people. And yet, and yet, not all were free. This word did not reach all enslaved people until June 19th, 1865. What we celebrate today, 155 days, years later, we celebrate this as Juneteenth. It is regarded as the end of slavery in America. And we celebrate slavery's end and mark that day with gusto. But what we miss in the memes is some important context. One is obvious. The eman that emancipation was delayed. Word did not come to Texas for two years, five months, and 19 days. And the economic gain for two more years of stolen labor and harvest is odious and ought to be repaid through reparations. But there's another piece of the context we need to lift up. It's also missed in all of the banners for today. It's that liberation was not granted by the white general who showed up that day. And so often the story of Juneteenth centers on the arrival and the announcement by that Union general. The central figure of Juneteenth is so often cast as a white man. So let us remember that the Emancipation Proclamation freed enslaved peoples in the rebellious states only. Those not yet in the Union's control. That slavery was still very legal in the border states. Emancipation arrived only at the arrival of the Union Army. Emancipation came when enslaved people left their plantations under the protection of the military and took up arms to join the fight for this country. You see, liberation wasn't done to formerly enslaved people. It was done by formerly enslaved people. The liberation extended also to this country. You see, without the aid of formerly enslaved people, the Union would have been lost. Slavery would not have been abolished and democracy would not have been established. This is the part of the story that I needed to learn this year. And I wonder if maybe you did too, because for so long I unintentionally centered the story of the white general or rather the news that he brought, rather than the struggle of emancipation, which began 200 years prior when chattel slavery was established on this land, the stolen land. And so today, as we come into this, this time of worship, we remember that how we tell our stories matter. Um, and this is how I tell this story now. Dr. Moore will tell it in a different way. And we gather today to hear God's story. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a reminder that as we sing together, we stay on mute. Um, but that doesn't mean your voice is muted, truly. Please do sing along. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of Thank you. 
Righteous God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us, like those of generations before us who resisted the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among your people and nations everywhere, especially here to the glory of your holy name through jesus christ our lord amen hear these words from the book that we know as esther chapter 9 reading in the new revised standard version verses 20 through 23 we find these words Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all of the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Aharas, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same month, year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from the enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow to gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. So the Jews adopted a custom, what they had begun to do, as Mordecai had written to them thus far a record of the story of God for the people. I invite you to pray with me as I share with you on the idea when a man needs justice. Lord, let these words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each and every heart here be acceptable in thy sight, for Lord, you are our liberator and the source of our strength. Amen. With reactions from outrage to silence, the writers of the book we call Christian Scripture preserve the revelation of God made known in Jesus with keen attention to the perspective of women. Make no mistake, in a culture where paternal patriarchs patronize, the very inclusion of women in God's revelation is noteworthy. John Wesley was right, and Dr. Paget would expect me to establish my ecclesial marker here. Wesley offered the Judeo-Christian worldview as the oldest perspective to demonstrate God putting into practice what it means to say that the best is 
yet to come. So God made man and said, oops. Oh, sorry. That's a bit of proof texting. It takes years of sexist oppression to force you to read the creation story with that kind of condescension. Nevertheless, if we believe that you should save the best for last, I do believe the last creation in the six days to be recorded is the creation of a woman. But again, I stopped reading too soon. God created the human one as a divine facsimile in the image of God created he them, male and female. And as Wesley once said, we are transcripts of the Trinity. So we are made for each other. We need each other. And when a man expects justice, He's simply seeking the creator covenanting God whose righteousness and holiness is best described as justice. For a long time, we've described love as the primary expression of a people of faith. But we can talk about love without liking a person. That sentimentality is not justice. We reference the mercy of God, sometimes offering a cheap grace that privileges our shortcomings at the expense of others. That trivializes justice. And lately we've spoken of hospitality, but a genuine warm welcome is only a sign of the justice of God. God's justice is described from Genesis to Revelation as what the Lord requires of us. Doing justice and righteousness is how God brings about for humanity what God has promised to do in the world. So when the people of God side with the majority and begin to look like everybody else, justice is perverted. And after the prophet's multiple warnings, this failure to practice justice is exactly what landed the children of Israel in exile. So in this story, we could tell the story as if Haman is central. It is as if what it is about is this cruel racist man who has reached the seat of power And using the influence that has been afforded by him reaching that power, he intends to annihilate the people of God. But that's not the way I tell this story. And it's certainly not the way that Mordecai's edict and the book we call Esther records the story. How you tell a story matters. You could think of this story of Esther as an odd place to talk today. It, 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 it's been a story that is always told when women want to tell our story. But I've titled this message, When a Man Wants Justice, because we need each other. We've told the story again and again as if it's the story about a queen and a banquet and an evil man falling on his own sword. And in our cancel culture, it might be read as a safe book on justice that doesn't include God. So let me make you angry with me right now. That's the kind of reading of text that erases those labeled as black from the history of the United States. And just because the stories of Benjamin Banneker and George Washington Carver and Daniel Hale Williams and Vivian Thomas and Carter G. Woodson are absent from your telling does not mean that science and surgery and scholarship were not impacted by those labeled as black from the very beginning. Julia Foote, Mary Woodson Foreman, and Harriet Jacobs preached and published before Maya Angelou and Oprah Winfrey were on the the reading list of 
those who believe themselves to be white. So we can tell this story as the story of Haman, or we can tell this story in a way that draws attention to what God is doing to set the world right when God's people have been marginalized, when God's people are threatened with death, when God's people are about to lose their very lives. You see, Esther had forgotten who she was and she'd been encouraged by her own family to forget her given name in order that she might fit in with everybody else. She'd given up her native habits and now enjoyed $100 spars and manicure, manicured fingers and toes. And her closet was filled with thousands of dollars of dresses she would never wear more than once. Fashion Fair, Revlon, and Mary Kay were no longer good enough for her skin. And while she went to Vegas sporting her African attire, her brothers and sisters back home were dealing with joblessness neighborhood gentrification, poor education programs, coronavirus, and inadequate health care. But who would hold anything against her for seizing the opportunity she'd been afforded? Well, while she was taking care of herself, chilling out and trying to survive, living with a complete idiot, you got to ask why Mordecai, who had coached her to survive, why he thought now she was missing an opportunity. Look back with me. Her current husband, the king, had been proud of his first wife. He attempted to demonstrate that, that at one of his infamous parties, drunk with wine, he forgot that his queen was not only beautiful, she was also a bodacious woman. And so bored and arrogant, the king crossed the border of sanity and said, send in my girl, wearing nothing but a crown. And when Vashti received her invitation, she said, I don't think so. Let me stop right here and remind you that some invitations are not to be accepted. Sometimes sitting at the seat of privilege is not how to ensure justice. Sometimes Simple integrity, quiet wisdom, and a clear no speaks louder than a title, a public position, or a privileged opportunity ever could. That's what was true for Vashti. She said no, and she meant no, and her response was unheard of, unprecedented, and unforgettable. In the face of opposition, injustice, and stupidity, that is what protest looks like. But such actions will always call into question the status quo and the reactions, the reactions will be quick, they will be legal, and they will be binding for generations to come. Know that many laws of oppression were written by oppressors in response to someone speaking up for the oppressed. But one doesn't glimpse justice because of a law. The revelation of God provided in Christian scripture keeps reminding us of human failure to keep God's laws in the face of God's faithfulness to keep trying to set the world right. Because God is searching then and now for those who would do exactly what God wanted done. But you can't do what you haven't seen. While Vashti's no was no, a door opened for Esther. But she knew she, she couldn't do the same thing as Vashti. She, she was in positions of power now. She had arrived, her ticket was punched. The problem was she was protecting her position rather than using it. So while Vashti spoke clearly, Esther intended to remain silent. And that 
is when Uncle Morty shows up saying, if you keep silent for such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise up from another quarter. When a man needs justice, somebody has to do something. And we, the church, are positioned not to enjoy our celebrations, but we are positioned to serve the many. That's God's justice. And we can't depend on God's justice coming from other quarters. We can't depend on a liberal manifesto of American democracy, fairness, and liberty for all, nor a conservative, moral, majority Republican platform. We can't expect the cultural practices that ruined God's design to fix the problem. Now is the time for the people of faith to proclaim like Martin Luther King, the ideals of the United States Constitution are not being lived out everywhere equally. Just as 155 years ago today, a special message had to be sent to Texas to inform free Americans labeled black that the president had liberated them 18 months earlier. In the same way, it is the task of the church today to proclaim the message to everyone that Jesus' resurrection 2,000 years ago overwrites the laws of death, sets the captives free, makes it possible for us to have a vision beyond our limited perspective, and enables us to live now as a glimpse of a preview of what, God, what the world would look like if God truly reigns. Because the hope of the world is that the rumors are true. That we celebrate the end of oppression. We protest to call attention to systems of injustice. But what gives us hope to protest is when we pause to celebrate. And that's what made Mordecai recognize it was time for him to put on sackcloth, for him to stir up the city, for him to make some noise. But it wasn't protest that he wanted. It was systemic change. And that's what God is calling for in the world today. Systemic change. Not just putting our people in power, but changing the system that would suggest that the powerful are to oppress those over whom they have influence. To change the system that suggests that some people are better than some, some others. To change the system that writes laws in order to write out those created in the image of God. Because God's concern for humanity never wavers, and God's intent was never for a Sabbath-only religion. God's intent is for a society of love and mutual care, which astonishes pagans and is recognizable as something entirely new in the world. If you were to go back and listen to my sermons, I used to ask this question. Will it take calamity or disaster or the silence of God before we notice that something isn't right? Well, now I have to say, can anybody say hashtag 2020? There's been calamity, and the church has been silent. There has been disaster, and the church has been silent. There has been seemingly silence from God, and the church has sought political power. But now, the cry has been raised because 
Someone like Mordecai has realized the system is choking out his very breath. And the protests have taken to the street. And those of us who have influence must use it wisely. Some of my students might be wondering how Pastor Jenny got me to preach on Juneteenth. Well, I want you to notice I'm not inviting you to an outdoor barbecue to celebrate the long delayed independence of a segment of one nation. I'm reminding you of a promise because American liberty is still overdue for many of her citizens. And it's overdue because this isn't an American promise. It's the creator's design. And if we who claim to be the people of God have any influence in the world, it is time for us to know that we gather at the altar as a preview of what God plans to do to bring all the world to Christ's table. We celebrate so that we have the hope to continue to protest against systems of inequity. We celebrate so that we remember what God has done we celebrate because the road is still long. The journey is still difficult and God's people are not completely free. But if you trust in Jesus, then I invite you to join with me in his name to lift your voice to show the world the light has come. And in the midst of this dark, darkness, we can look to that light and celebrate as brothers and sisters who have been made free because of God. Amen. Infinity. 
believe. In our doubt there is believing. In our life eternity. In our death a resurrection. At the last a victory. Unrevealed until it sees something God alone can see. Celebration rises up from the deep places finding voice in the light and air no longer denied. Celebration rises, not indifferent to the suffering, not ignoring the sorrow. Celebration comes at a cost. Celebration rises, remembering the way we have come, the paths taken that have brought us here now to this place and time of celebration. Celebration rises up and up full of remembering. Remembering the ones led to freedom by Harriet. Remembering lives and freedom stolen. Stolen even now we remember Philando, Jamar, George, Richard, Ahmad, Brianna, Tony, Clementa, Cynthia, Ethel, Daniel, Taiwanza, Susie, Sharonda, Depayne, Myra, Martin, Medgar, Emmett. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Celebration rises recognizing what has been done and left undone. Knowing there is still and yet much to do, still so much farther to go. Celebration rises, naming the victories, recognizing the challenges yet ahead. Celebration rises on voices offering unfinished praise. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Celebration rises, re resisting illusions to be embraced by the real and abiding presence of God who breaks our chains and sets us free for freedom and power and love and joy. God of our weary ears, God of our silent tears, thou has brought us thus far on our way. Thou, who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted support the weak and help the suffering honor all people love and serve the lord rejoicing in the power of the holy spirit the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Amen.